So my lesson tonight is about evangelism, but not the usual one that describes you know, the why and the how to carry out the important ministry of evangelism. My remarks this evening will be centered around the 21st century's greatest challenge to evangelism, to evangelizing you know, our community, our state, our nation, the world. After all, each place and each congregation has its own set of skills and resources. Each has its own approach in bringing the gospel to the lost in their community or in America. We support different types of mission works in different countries, as do other churches. But make no mistake, whether it's a mission church in Maine or a mega church in metropolitan Dallas, we all face a similar foe, the same obstacle to faith in our day and that is a multi-dimensional and competing belief system called postmodernism. That's the obstacle to evangelism. You see, it's not sex and drugs and rock and roll that challenges Christianity's claim on the minds and hearts of our nation. If it were so, it would not be that great a challenge. No, what is overtaking our nation is a new way of thinking that seeks to replace the way we think about sex, drugs, and rock and roll, as well as how we think about ourselves and about God. The true challenge to evangelizing America in the 21st century is how will we answer the postmodern ideology that has through college campuses and most media established itself as a mainstream thought pattern for nearly half of the population in this country. So before we describe postmodernism and its thinking, we need to take a look at what kind of thinking came before it and how it was formed. For this, we're going to take a, maybe a five minute primer on the history of thought and how we arrived at where we are in our thinking today. So for the purpose of brevity, we can say that in the last 2,000 years, the thinking pattern of Western civilization can be summarized into three main categories of belief systems. Number one is ethical theism, called ethical theism. This term describes the view of truth and morality which formed the basis for much of the Western world. Ethical theism believes that there are absolute truths, that there are standards for right and wrong which are unchanging and which apply to everyone. This view of the world, this belief system can be traced from the prophets of the Old Testament all the way to the framers of the Declaration of Independence who wrote, we hold these truths, these absolute truths, to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Ethical theism believes that there is absolute truth, absolute good, and these are revealed to men by God himself. The next thought system to develop, modernism. Modernism began to eclipse ethical theism during the Renaissance period, 1300, 1600. Modernism was forged by several converging events and revolutions. For example, the Renaissance began the shift away from ethical theism as artists and thinkers exalted man and not God in their works. If you go to museums and you look at the old, old painters, the masters, what you see are paintings of God or images taken from the Bible and, 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 and painted. This shift in emphasis gave rise to the idea that man was at the center of all things. Then the Enlightenment age, 1600s and forward, saw writers and philosophers build on the humanism of the Renaissance movement. They began to speculate that, well, if man was at the center, then man's ideas should be the determining factor in understanding what is true and what is good and what is moral. 
And then the industrial revolution of the 17th and 18th hundreds saw great strides forward in technology. This added a form of credibility to the Enlightenment's theory of man's self-sufficiency. Man no longer needed to look to God for answers because he was solving all sorts of problems by himself and only had to look within in order to find solutions and happiness. And then of course, the final blow to ethical theism came when Charles Darwin provided an alternative theory to the origin of man, which did not factor in a divine source. And so with the popularization of, uh, popularization rather, of Darwin's theory of the origin of man, modernism officially displaced ethical theism as the Western world's basic belief system. And so as a belief system, modernism had the following characteristics. Man was the arbiter of truth. Modernism placed its faith in rational and empirical science to solve all the problems of mankind. For modernists, any truth that cannot be experienced and measured was relative. In other words, your experience of truth may be different from my experience of truth, but they are both nevertheless true. This worldview held sway into the middle of the 20th century, but in the 60s, a new form of thought began to displace even modernism. And this is what we call post-modernism. Post-modernism established itself more quickly than modernism, perhaps because the way to communicate became much faster in the 20th century than ever before. Postmodernism is a complex thought system and the best way to explain it may be simply to list what it believes rather than reviewing how it came to be. For example, postmodernism believes that truth is a product of a person's culture. For example, there is truth from the Afro-American perspective. There is truth from a French perspective, from a Russian during the Stalin eras, perspective. Truth is what your cultural life experience is. That's what truth is. Human beings are simply a product of evolution and specific culture and experience. There is no divine spiritual component to human beings, according to postmodernism. You are the sum total of your own and your ancestors' experience. Some other features of this thinking. People are part of the ecosystem, not above the ecosystem. Taking care of the environment is really taking care of ourselves. Another thought, there is no universal truth, there is no absolute right or wrong. Right and wrong depend solely on your cultural experience and values. And then unlike ethical theists who believe that humanity is not progressing but rather waiting for deliverance, and modernists who believe that through science and technology we can make the world better, postmodernists believe that things are not getting better, but the fault lays with the oppressive values of past Western civilization. So if you want to summarize this little history of thinking, we could say that these three lines of thinking are embodied by recent politicians. For example, George W. Bush, he was an ethical theist, moral clarity. You know, you go to his uh, library in, in Austin, I believe it is, or is it in Dallas? No, it's in, in Dallas, yeah. Anyways, he has he, you know, a room dedicated to decision points, how he made decisions. You know? So Bush was an ethical theist. Bill Clinton represented modernist thinking. Isn't he the one who said, well, it depends on what is, is? <laughs> That's modernist thinking. Al Gore spoke the postmodern language of environmentalism. Barack Obama also, or Barack, excuse me, Obama also followed postmodern thinking in his rejection of the traditional Western value in favor of a new world order structured around globalism. That's postmodern thinking. And of course, Donald Trump is a pragmatist 
poorly disguised as an ethical theist, and you have to unravel that one on your own. So now we have the postmodern dilemma. <clears throat> I said that postmodernism is Christianity's biggest challenge, but at the moment Christianity is not postmodernism's biggest challenger. Postmodernist thinkers are grappling with a different problem today, a problem that has arisen as is the result of the 9-11 attacks in New York City several years back. See, part of the reason I've used up so much time explaining the different thought patterns is that this knowledge helps us understand the main issue facing serious postmodern thinkers today. Today, the problem can be stated in the following way. How will postmodern America deal with absolute evil? You see, some are saying that the 9-11 attacks rang the death knell of postmodernism because the attacks were so evil, they were so enormous, they were so depraved that no one could justify them under any terms, any system of thought. In other words, it was so obvious to Americans, to the West, that this attack was so wrong that no appeal to postmodern mumbo jumbo about what's wrong for you can be right for me could make this horrific act right in some way. Some tried it. Some people tried it. I remember reading articles where people were saying, well, you know, the United States deserved to be attacked because of what it had done in the past. You know? that, that, that was you know, postmodern hogwash trying to make sense of the horrible thing that had happened. But no appeal to the idea that in one culture something can be good, but in another culture it can be wrong and we just have to tolerate each other's differences. We couldn't, we couldn't get to the point of just tolerating 5,000 people being murdered in a single day. Because murdering thousands of innocent people in cold blood was so atrocious that it couldn't be defended under the postmodern banner of tolerance. You see what I'm saying? The absolute wrongness of it morally destroyed the basic premises of postmodernism and sent it into the ground zero heap of the World Trade Center wreckage along with those planes and the bodies of those people. So since then, the United States has had a problem larger than the issue of executing justice on the 9-11 attackers. I mean, this was decided by invading Afghanistan and Iraq. No, since then the issue has been, how will we now think about right and wrong? How are we going to think about good and evil in the future? And so in pursuing the solution to this moral dilemma, America can eventually go one of three ways. Number one, we can lose hope. You know, the nation can choke on its collective pride and refuse to acknowledge the obvious, that there is absolute good and absolute evil. We can wring our hands and obsess over the awfulness of it all and retreat into depression, like much of Eastern Europe. We can become pessimistic and cynical and nihilistic and like Jonah, just roll ourselves up and, and, and die. We can do that. Or we can learn to live with it. You know, you quickly heard the voices after 9-11, President Bush at the time, saying, hey, let's just get back to normal. Let's show these guys, you know, they didn't hurt us. Let's, let's go shopping, go travel, fix your house. Go out and spend some money. It's the patriotic thing to do, consumerism. <laughs> Let's just adjust to the new normal and pretend that everything is okay. I don't know, but psychologists call this solution denial. And then there's a third way to fill the void. And that is, we can experience spiritual revival. Now that postmodernism's concept of moral relativism has been exposed as a fraud, as weak, as corrupt, what moral standards shall we use? The answer to this is easy for us as Christians, but not so for American society in general. 
The main lesson of the bombing is that there is intrinsic absolute evil and if this is so, there must also be intrinsic absolute good. You see the, the issue here? And there's the rub, there's the problem. I want you to stay with me here. If there is absolute good and evil, then there has to be a superior moral authority. You can't have one without the other. And if this is so, then this truth must be encoded somehow. And if this is so, then this code can be known. And if so, it has authority over us. And if this is so, we are then accountable to this code. And if this is so, we will then be judged by this code. And if this is so, we will be condemned because we all have violated this code. And if this is so, we need help. And if this is so, we need a helper and a savior. And if this is so, then Christianity must be true, must be correct, because it is the only faith in the world that deals with the moral failure of man through mercy and not through law. And this is true because mercy is a higher virtue than lawfulness. And so America is in a dilemma because the most promising road out of the ruins of postmodernism is spiritual revival. And spiritual revival leads you straight to Christianity. The very thing that had been rejected and denigrated as being irrelevant to the postmodern man has now become his best option. So there is a moral crisis in America, a, a, a red alert, if you wish, for everyone. But it's not the cries of a decline in our morality, it's the cathartic struggle of a nation coming to grip with the brutal reality that evil does exist and that evil's counterpart, goodness, righteousness, justice, has a divine source that demands to be acknowledged. And this demand is the basis for the very first commandment from him. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. The real danger for us is not that of another bomb or a poisoning attack or maybe losing a war. The real danger facing this nation is that America refuses to turn to the true God and the source of goodness and refuse to acknowledge the true incarnation into human reality and that is Jesus Christ. That's the great danger. The real threat before us is that we are being presented two choices, both of which are false and lead to destruction by different means. Choice number one, we are in danger of making patriotism our God. Does that have a ring of truth to it? The seduction of worshiping at the altar of nationalism and putting the true God into the service of our politics. There's nothing wrong with a policy of national self-interest until it compromises the higher laws of justice and mercy before God. The danger with this choice is the inherent belief that America can be great without faith in God and without obedience to God. A familiar passage that we in this congregation often refer to, Psalm 127, unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. President uh, Dwight B. Uh, D. Rather, Eisenhower struck the correct balance of unity and faith as the basis for this nation's greatness and survival when in 1954 he urged Congress to add the words under God. So the Pledge of Allegiance would read one nation under God. He's the one that said you put under God after one nation. The only way to make America great is to find a way to make it one nation under God again. Otherwise, choice number two will become a reality. Choice number two, we risk making government our God. And there are some that are pushing that. 
You see, with choice number one, we trust our collective identity as Americans to save us, to keep us safe and prosperous. You know, we're number one, we're the best, we're the strongest, we're the richest, we're the smartest. The sin here is pride, the audacity to think that we are sufficient unto ourselves. With choice number two, making government our God, we trade in personal freedom and responsibility and social mobility for the assurance of being cared for. This choice has many names, collectivism, socialism, communism, but in the end it's basically transferring the original responsibility for one's life from God to the government. The obvious problem here is that God never fails us, but the government who can give you everything can, as history has demonstrated, usually ends up taking everything. You know what they say, the government that gives you everything can also take everything. And that's usually how it happens. Ask the Russians, ask the Chinese, ask the Cubans, and more recently ask the Venezuelans about this particular truth. The basic sin here in choice number two is laziness and a low grade type of greed where a person approves the forced taking of another's wealth in order to even out everybody's standard of living, which usually declines anyways over time. In the end, the only people who have wealth and freedom in the government as God system are the people who are in the government. Now these things don't happen overnight, but what we're seeing in our nation at the moment is a fight to the death between the factions that represent in one way or another these two choices. You know, no empires or nations last forever, but a nation whose God is the Lord and where are found people who call on God through Jesus Christ, that nation can receive divine help and direction that can guarantee its survival and its prosperity. So there in a few you know, brief moments, a brief presentation, is an explanation of the true challenge we face in evangelizing a postmodern America. Now the natural response to all of this is, well, what can we do? What action can we as Christians take? And there are many things like prayer and perseverance that we need to continue to do in every age and circumstance, but at this juncture, I believe that there are several things that we should focus on as members of the church, given the task of reaching this generation for Christ, because it's, it's on us. We're responsible for evangelizing the world beginning with our community and our nation and, and the world. We're responsible in this day and age, this is on us. A hundred years ago, they, that generation was not faced with the problem of postmodernism. they had other issues. But this is our issue, this is our problem. So what do we do? A Couple of things. First of all, let's recognize exactly who we are. In this time of fear and anxiety and moral confusion, we need to remember our role in the world. Paul says that the Lord's church is the pillar and the support of the truth. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. You know, the church is the only organization on earth that has been ordained by God to present His truth to the world. No other organization has been given that responsibility. If there was ever a time when the church needed to come to the forefront, this is it. The weakness and error of the postmodern thinkers has been exposed. Islam, as, as an alternative answer, has been dealt a blow from which it'll never recover. There's a huge void in the minds and the hearts of men and women yearning for truth, and the church has been divinely established to fill that void. And so the time to be bold is now, the time to let our community and our town and our state and our nation know about Christ and salvation is now. You know, if the church were a business, I would tell it to triple its advertising and marketing budget for the next year because there are lots of new customers for what we want who are out there. 
A second thing we need to focus on, let's remember what we're here for. In the church of Christ, in every age, in good or bad times, evangelism is always job number one. In a world suddenly looking for answers, for comfort, for assurance, for life beyond death, the good news becomes the most refreshing and encouraging message of all. Now let's not make the mistakes of the past where we substituted something else for the good news. You know what I'm saying, you know, that, well, you know, we'd, we'd be preaching to people and what we were preaching, the core of our message was, well, uh, there's only one true church. Well, that's true, but that's, that's not <laughs> That's not what people are searching for. Or that a cappella singing during public worship is a biblical thing. That's true, but again, that's not the thing that people are searching for. Or that you know, in, in, the, in the New Testament church, uh, we have male spiritual leadership. Well, again, that's biblically true, but that's not exactly what people are looking for. These things are true and biblical, but they are not the gospel itself. We can teach people these things, but not before we preach the good news to them. The good news that God forgives and grants eternal life to sinners who believe in Jesus Christ and express their faith in repentance and baptism, that's great news. They may not listen now because they're enthralled with the choices that they've made, but at some point the false promises of both the systems that I've talked about that try to rule America without God will become evident. We need to maintain the voice and the light of the gospel even if it will only be heard by a broken and prodigal people stripped of its glory and wealth by the one who bestows such things on nations. Hey, if we're rich and prospering, let's preach the gospel to a rich and prospering nation. And if we're defeated and broken and cast aside, let's preach the gospel to the broken and cast aside nation. Our role never changes, never. You know, heaven forbid, oh wow, wow, what if the Chinese, I mean the communist Chinese, what if somehow you know, they destroyed our navy and they, 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 they hacked our systems, you know, our military systems, and somehow they, they took over the country? What would we do? <laughs> We'd preach the gospel. We wouldn't be able to do it this freely. We'd have to have 30, 40 people who decide to have another 10, 12 people secretly meet in their homes to have communion, to read the Bible, the way they actually do it now in China. But the job would be the same. The work would be the same, just a little more dangerous. What else should we do? Let's reach the next generation. You know, I'm glad that we use up a good portion of time and resources to minister to our children and to our teens. We need to equip them to be able to make the case for Christ to the generation of the future. People of my generation have pretty much made up their minds about these things, but our young people, they're still figuring things out. You know, we have a ceremony here in front and we, uh, you know, we give Bibles to the graduates and I, I noticed the teenagers, you know, if you've been here long enough, those teenagers at one time, they were like the little kids running up and down the st on the stage and you know, doing all that kind of stuff. And now you know, the elders are presenting them with Bibles and prayers and sending them on their way. They're going off to college or technical school or getting jobs and you know, they're getting out there in the world. You know. But do you realize they're getting out there in the world? And the world is not friendly to Christianity. The world is not friendly to people of faith. We need to equip them to be able to make the case for Christ to people who are rejecting Christ. Let's help our children and grandchildren be well versed in the scripture, able to defend their faith, not intimidated by much of the godless mumbo jumbo parading as knowledge coming out of most universities these days. The sad thing is many times 
The opposition is led by the professors that are teaching them. You know, where do you think all of this has come from? And 90% of the universities, you know, postmodern thinking reigns supreme. You don't believe me, look at the newspapers <laughs> and look what's happening because of it. So let's prepare our children. I mean, I mean not hoping accidentally that they'll pick up enough information in church and Bible class you know, to be able to stand firm in their faith when they're challenged by their own professors and by their peers at college. When some young Christian guy meets a girl in college that he likes and, and you know, is interested in and asks her out on a date or something like that. Maybe, I don't know if we even do that anymore. But anyways, let's go have a coffee together you know, and, <laughs> and talk and get to know each other. And that lovely young girl, when she finds out that he's a Christian, that he actually goes to church, her interest in him begins to go down. Instead of saying, oh, you're a Christian, great, where do you go to church? Instead it's, oh, you're a Christian? Really? People still do that? Some of us guys our age may not remember what that feels like to get that kind of rejection. How much that hurts. Or our young women who are pressured into compromising their values in order to fit in, in order to be part of the group, in order to be accepted when their defense is, well, you know, as a Christian, that's not something that I want to participate in. And they get back, come on, really? Ah, man, that's baby stuff, grow up. Is your daughter or granddaughter prepared to face that kind of rejection and humiliation? Because I'm telling you, it's out there and it's waiting. Let's prepare them as best we can. Home study, discussions, Christian school and college, if possible, not possible for a lot of families, but if possible, steady church attendance, meaningful involvement, so that they can function successfully as Christians in a largely unbelieving society, growing more and more hostile to the Christian faith as time goes by. Remember, in only a little while, the Lord will come to bring us to the place that He has prepared for each of us. Let's remain faithful. Let's remain busy in His work until that time. Let's be a light in this world of darkness, <laughs> in this world of darkness where people consider themselves light. And as Jesus said, if the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? And I'm saying to you, how great is the darkness that exists in our society today? And I encourage you, do not be afraid to be the light in that great darkness. This is the hand that has been dealt to us in our day, in our age. This is what we have to face. Let's be faithful, nevertheless. In any ways, or in any case, I do encourage all of us to remain faithful, busy in the work itself. And if you need to begin or continue your walk, if you need help to respond to the indifference and disbelief in this world. Maybe you don't feel equipped enough. That's okay, we have elders, we have ministers. We're here to try to equip the church to live faithful, productive lives in this, in this dark world. In any case, if you are in need of prayer or encouragement at this time that we might provide and minister to you, we do encourage you to come forward now as John leads us in our song of encouragement.